Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to a brand new episode of Mike Adelic. I am Mike Brancatelli. This is Mike Adelic. Welcome to the show. I am back from Peru, and I'm going to be doing a solo cast about that, just uh, recounting my, my journey, my trip, my travels, my experience, and my insights. And I'm really going to do it this time. I'm not going to say that I'm going to do it and then not do it. Uh, because I believe this will be an important uh, podcast to share, uh, sharing my experience, sharing with uh, what I, sharing with you what I've learned, and I think uh, it's yeah, it's going to be a good one. So stay tuned for that one. That'll be out soon. But in the meantime, I have three amazing conversations with three amazing human beings. Uh, a couple of my friends that I recorded some conversations with um, down at, in the Amazon jungles in Peru at uh, the ayahuasca center that I was at. And um, I, I'm, really, I'm really happy with these. I, I really enjoyed the conversations. I hope you guys will too. And so there's three of those conversations. This will be the first one with my friend, Alan. And uh, Alan was a new friend, actually. Uh, I, I met Alan and uh, we, we started talking about podcasts and how, you know, how podcasts have really both, uh, how podcasts have helped both of us. Uh, and I, I'd like to think that a lot of you people out there uh, would agree that, uh, that this medium is really uh, something that is, is helping you learn and grow and um, you know, maybe just offering also an alternative source of entertainment uh, from all the other things that are out there. But I've gotten tremendous value out of listening to podcasts myself. Um, that's why I do this show. And, uh, and Alan mentioned the same thing to me as well. We had a good conversation. I said, hey, why don't we podcast together? I, I feel like, you know, I feel like it could be a good one. So I think it was, I think it is. And um, yeah, I think you guys are going to enjoy this, this journey, you know, especially if you, you like listening to shows where, where I, I sort of get personal and talk about my, my journey. Alan does the same thing here. He gets pretty personal and talks about his journey and, and opens up and, and is a little vulnerable. And uh, man, I really appreciated it. It was, it was just such a, a good conversation. And I really related to a lot of things that he was saying. I think you guys will too. Um, we talked a lot about, uh, about Alan's life and what he's done, but he's done so many more things. I didn't even get a chance to cover all of them. We sort of just went where the conversation, uh, fl- where the conversation went. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, some of the other things that he did that, uh, that we didn't get to, um, you know, he's been all over the place. He, he's traveled to Spain he's traveled to, uh, the Caribbean where he was, um, working as a tour guide on sailboats and snorkeling trips. He, uh, he walked across Spain. That's why he went there on a 600 mile personal pilgrimage on the Camino de Santiago, um, which is a very famous, uh, pilgrimage, uh, that people go and do. So look that up if Sounds very interesting. He spent time in India and Thailand and Guatemala meditating and studying various different spiritual traditions. Um, and he, uh, he, shares a, he shares a part of a, a slice of his life with us. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's really, really a, a good conversation. I really enjoyed uh, hanging out with him. And I hope you guys will too. So like I said, this is the first part of uh, the three-part series of the Jungle Talks, Jungle Conversations. And um, that's pretty much it. That's it from me. But I, I do want to just say uh, that I, I, want, I appreciate all of you. Thank you very much. I want to give a shout out to the Patreon supporters, uh, all of you that, that donate money on patreon.com slash Mike Brank, B-R-A-N-C. Uh, thank you so much. Really, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody. And a couple of new people that I could just think of off the top of my head, I'll give shout outs to uh, Sarah, uh, Mike, Ben, um, Richard, Clint, Hell, Zach. Um, who else? I feel like I'm leaving someone out. Um, Samuel, thank you. Thank you to all of you guys. And I know I probably left a couple people out, but uh, those are the people that I can remember off the top of my head right now as I'm recording this. So thank you to all of you people. Also, if you join on Patreon uh, and you contribute uh, to the show, you, uh, you get access to the, our private WhatsApp group, which is pretty cool. It's just, um, it's, it's sort of a little bit different, you know, different thing than like a Facebook, Facebook group or something. It's just a WhatsApp group. And, um, and we text and we share 
articles or videos or thoughts or anything. It's it's a pretty cool group of people. I think I'm going to keep it limited to about 20 people. I think right now we have like 13 or 14. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to have to see how that works because, because it could be kind of hectic with a, with a large group of people. But I just had that thought just now. So maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Someone let me know. I mean, would you like to be in a WhatsApp group with 100 people? Um, we'll see. That, that could be interesting. Anyway, thank you to all those people. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to the people that take the time out of their days to go onto Apple Podcasts, iTunes, whatever it's called now, and uh, tap that little five-star button and leave a review and write something from the heart uh, to me, to the show. It's tremendous. I, I really I just thank you so much for doing that because my Gadelic now has 115 five-star reviews, and uh, that's great. Uh, it's really great. It helps expose the, the show to more people, helps attract uh, some bigger-name guests who, uh, that I like to have on the show. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much it, really. So thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. And I really hope that uh, you enjoy these conversations that I had down in the Amazon jungle with these wonderful people. All right, without further ado, let's get to this conversation with my new friend, Alan. Take it away, Terrence McKenna. Psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. They open to us the possibility that everything we know is wrong. We don't need new laws that control our consciousness and rigidly place it in a prison. Cognitive liberty. The fact that as adults, if we're not hurting anybody else, we should have the right to explore the contours of our own consciousness without any mediation or legislation on the part of somebody else. Reject authority. Authority is a lie. Or is it perception? Information is power. But we have to seize, seize the opportunity. The opportunity. The opportunity. So you you moved to New York at, at 29. Yeah, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was 29. And uh, well, I was actually signed up to start grad school in Denver to study. It was like a international affairs, like a master's degree. And uh, I went to the orientation week, like August of that year, it was like first week before classes start. And during that orientation week, I had to meet with an advisor just to figure out the plan, like what are your goals with this and everything. And I went to that meeting and I realized I had no idea why, like I didn't, like I had no idea really why I wanted to study that other than I didn't know what else to do with my life and I like travel and like intercultural communication and meeting people around the world. But but otherwise I didn't really have a career plan and I realized that that was kind of an anomaly like in that program everybody knew what they wanted to do with their life and I had no idea mm. so I dropped out and then I really didn't know like I was, I was kind of in a place where I didn't have any plan but I knew I wanted to leave Denver and so it was either move move to California to San Diego which is where <clears throat> like my best friend lives and I was just gonna start a life there or go to New York and uh, pursue this like long I had this dream for a long time of like pursuing acting but I'd still I couldn't figure I couldn't decide what to do so I packed my stuff in my car and I left my dad's house and I got on I-25 which goes north south and when I got to uh, I-70 I had a choice to go east or west and I basically just in the like, no last way. minute decision I went east this is like a movie in itself <laughs> yeah it kind of is yeah so that's how I decided to go to New York. You might want to just move a little. Yeah, bit. yeah, a little closer. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Um, that's crazy. So you were in Den. So you're from Denver? No, I was born in California, in Los Angeles. Well, Orange County, and then we lived in L.A. But I left when I was like seven. We moved to France. Lived in France for a while. Why, why France? Moved there with my dad for his job. 
he's a he was a computer programmer. He got a job there, so I moved there with him, and he met a French woman. They got married, oh, so we ended okay. up staying for about five years, and uh, then Colorado for high school and college, then Africa. Then what were you doing in Africa? Peace Corps. You joined the Peace Corps. Yeah, I was right in, out of college. Right out of college. Yeah. What was the motivation behind that? Uh, well, uh, I just, I studied finance in college after changing my major many times. I settled on finance because it seemed like the most useful. And, um, but then once graduation came around, I had no desire to like get a job in that field, but I, I wanted to appear motivated. Like I was doing something with my life and I wanted an adventure. So I joined the Peace Corps. And I went into their microfinance program, basically. But it was really just an excuse uh, to kind of delay a choice of mm. what, what I perceived was a necessary like career path choice that I was not in any position to make. So I went to the Peace Corps and I went to spent two years in Cameroon. Yeah. Um, I find yeah. a lot of people, I mean, I, I think I did something similar myself, like the, de- the delay of choice or the delay of like, you know, it's sticking making a commitment to something mm-hmm. yeah and being like oh that's my life now yeah but i think you did something that so many people do which is like go to college just kind of get something that you think will benefit you in the financial realm yeah but you weren't necessarily that interested in it no not at all if i if i were to go back again if i were to wake up and all of a sudden i'm in my 18 year old body a, I don't even know if I would go to college, and if I did, yeah, I'd probably would study something either like anthropology or something even like theater, mm-hmm. you know, something something interesting and fun, like yeah. But at the time, I had a lot of fear. For some reason, it was ingrained in my mind, probably through my family, that uh, certain things that you study in college are useless, right. And other things are useful. And the purpose of college is it's a utilitarian, it's, it's a, you do it as a useful thing yeah, to so apply you can to your life. make money and exactly. be an adult. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think pretty, our society at large pretty much emphasizes that, like from an early age, it's like, these things are the important things to know. Yeah. This other stuff, creativity, arts, humanities, this other realm, it's like, nah, you're not going to make That's money. That's not useful. Yeah. 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 And I also think it's it's a lot to put on an 18-year-old who doesn't have a lot of life experience to to know what they're going to do with their life because you're supposed to kind of figure that out at the beginning of college and then you base your studies on that. And there, I think there are some some lucky souls out there who know from from when they're a kid. They know what they want to do and they just do it. Yeah. But I think most people in college have no idea. And it's not until... It's often you see people when they hit like 30, they kind of have a crisis of like, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I like the system that they, you know, a lot of people do in England or Australia. They take like a gap year. I yeah. think a gap like three years <laughs> would be even beneficial uh, just to get out there and travel and try different things when you're kind of in a young place where you don't have a lot of ideally not too many responsibilities yet so you can kind of try on different things and see what works and then and then go from there and do something that that like pleases the soul rather than expectations of family or society or yeah or the mind you know yeah totally yeah. I, it is i mean you're 18 years old your brain isn't even fully developed yet and that's, that's and true like for me i had student loan companies that were like, yeah, we'll give you this money and you'll go to school and don't worry, you'll pay it back later. But this is how you do it. This is what everyone's doing. Mm -hmm. Go down that path. And it's just, it's not for everybody, Mm -mm. you know, especially for people that don't know what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's kind of a lot, it's a big debt to take on too at an early age. Did you go to, did you go to college? What'd you study? I I didn't want to go to college. I, I went, so my story is actually, I got kicked out of high school. When I was a junior, because they just did, they, they were like, we don't know what to do with this kid. Like, he doesn't want to do anything. For discipline reasons? Yeah, yeah, for discipline reasons. Like, my grades were okay, but they, like, I would miss class all the time. I would pull pranks all the time. Like, so my guidance counselor advised me to drop out of school, get a GED, and go to college because that would be a better fit for me. Uh huh, interesting. So I did that. But um, then when I was in college, like, I, 
I went to the community college, did that, and then I applied. I, I went, I went to uh, first Arizona and then Buffalo. Uh-huh. Arizona was just a party, like a shit show. Party. University of Arizona. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, no, ASU. ASU. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah even Sun more Devils. so. Yeah, it was it was insane. Um, great times, but I didn't get anything academically done. Yeah. Uh, because I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't have a passion for learning or curiosity. Yeah. It, it hadn't been ignited in me yet from mm-hmm. the the public school system, and so, um, yeah. And then there was a point in college that I I wanted to stop going because I had caught this acting bug. Like I was writing screenplays and acting and uh-huh. and doing stuff. And I was out in California, and I'm just like, I just want to do this. Like I don't want to go back. My parents kind of persuaded me and my friends, they were like, look, just get it done. You're almost done. Just mm. get it and you'll have it. And, you know, now I'm like saddled with this big student loan debt, right. which is a huge annoyance, which a lot of people in America are right now. There's yeah. a huge problem with the student loan. Massive problem. Yeah. How old are you? I'm, uh, I just turned 34. Okay, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are paying it off for more than half of their working life. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's insane, man. Yeah, it's, and it's something that you could never escape. You know, they just keep coming coming after you. Yeah. Yeah, I remember in college, my first credit card I got, like, they they had, like, a little booth set up, like, in the commons area, you know, where students are walking by, and it's, like, free T-shirt just for filling out this piece of paper. And, yeah, free T-shirt, great. Fill out whatever. I'll fill out the form. I don't <laughs> care. And it happened to be, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but they were set up, like, about two months before spring break. And... Sure enough, like a month later, or even a few weeks later, credit card comes in the mail. I'm like, ah, whatever, I don't need it. But I had it. And then spring break's coming up, and it's like, you guys, let's go to Jamaica. A lot of my friends, some of my friends had money, you know, from their parents. Others didn't, but but I, I didn't want to miss out. Yeah. You know, and so that was my first credit card charge in my life was a, <laughs> a plane to Jamaica. And, uh, yeah, in a pretty debaucherous time there. And it was, you know, maybe it was worth it, but uh, it was kind of the beginning of what became a snowball over life. Of yeah. Like, you know, I didn't have much, like, responsibility. This was never taught to me. Um, you know, I had to learn the hard way. I learned, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think many people really get it. You don't really learn it. They they sort of don't really teach it to you. Like, the, you know, the, what it means to have debt and all mm-hmm. this stuff and, um, when you're young, it's just like, cool, free money. Yeah. You yeah. know, I'll worry about it later. I'll worry about it later when I have a job and I'm living in the real world. And yeah, minimal you know. payment, $40 a month. Great. Yeah. That's easy. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so then, so, all right. So Peace Corps, so then Africa. So what was that like? You, you were stationed in Africa? Yeah, I was. Yeah. So I finished uh, college. I was supposed to go to Haiti actually for Peace Corps. That's where they assigned me based on language. Cause I spoke French from growing up. Mm-hmm. And, um, but then like right when I was supposed to go a few weeks before they notified me, they were pulling out of Haiti. It was one of the many like coups, like president was overthrown or was chaos. So they, I didn't go there, but, uh, yeah, a few months later they switched me to Cameroon. So I went to Cameroon. Where, where's Cameroon? Cameroon's on the West coast of Africa on the Atlantic coast, like just, just above the equator. So it's, you know, it's tropical. Uh, there's a coast, like part of it is on the coast. You can swim in the Atlantic then it kind of goes inland they say cameroon like kind of embodies every climate and ecosystem of africa there's desert in the north there's mountain there's jungle there's high jungle low jungle uh, and then there's like the beach region um so yeah i went there for two years and um i mean how to put that in a nutshell i mean it was very hard it was like a very challenging time you were like 23 24 yeah exactly i was 23 23 yeah i turned I turned 24, like, right when I got there. So basically from when I was 24 to 26, I was in Africa. And, um, yeah, I was supposed to be doing uh, microfinance was the program I was signed up to do. Um, But a few months into that, I realized I was, yeah, I was working for, like, an NGO that did microfinance, like, uh, basically working with small banks in these villages to help people, like, farmers and things, get small micro loans to help expand their business. And, um, but there was so much corruption in it. Like it was just like a very, very corrupt system. The, 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 the heads of these little village banks were taking money and, and they were yeah. taking money from, yeah, from the, from the, the NGO, bank, from the bank itself. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. 
I, I'm not sure how it all worked, but it was just a very corrupt system and everybody knew it. And right. so I felt weird being associated with it. And I felt no passion even for the project. Like I ended up, I was just like, kind of like sitting in the bank. Like they just asked me to kind of watch the bank, the tellers. Be watch the, the bank. Yeah. Like <laughs> in, in, an Af- in that part of Africa, like putting, having a white man, like sitting somewhere, it like gives it some kind of prestige for, okay. you know? And so sometimes I just felt like a, yeah, kind of like a, like a trophy, like a trophy or, you know, just like an object. Just, just, just make appearances, you know? Right. But I'm like 24 years old. I had no clue. I didn't have, you know, these villagers are like, you know, a lot of them coming into the bank were like, you know, 60 years old. They had seen some shit in life. And uh, here I am like pretending to be like some, some guy who knows what the hell he's doing. In right. This microfinance bank. So. Yeah. And, and maybe the, it gives a little credibility to what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, under the surface, there's this corruption and stuff, but but it's okay because there's there's a, a white American guy, white American yeah, guy. Yeah, so there. it's legit. It's yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, st- I after a few months of that, I, I told Peace Corps I don't want to do this project. So they sent me to another village where I was assigned as an English teacher uh, at a university. Um, it was a Seventh Day Adventist christian like private university did you have any teaching no experience none or? at all no well you spoke english so that was I spoke, it. yeah i did speak english but no it, and the the peace corps volunteers that went to peace corps in order to teach like they received a training beforehand for because at the beginning of peace corps you for like three months you kind of train you train mm-hmm. about what you're going to do so their training was about teaching they received some you know some like uh, curriculums and, and books and documents to teach from but i didn't get any of that because i just kind of jumped into the teaching role so so yeah, all of a sudden I'm an English teacher at a university where most a lot of the students are older than me. Um, just because it's Africa, like some people just started later, and they want to learn English. They, yeah, they they all want to learn English. Um, but uh, yeah, it was definitely a trial by fire because I had to just kind of make it up as I go. There was no internet where right. I lived. Internet was when still, was this? This was 2004. Okay, so internet existed wow. in the capital, like in Yaoundé the Peace Corps office, you could access internet. It was slow, but you know, yeah. so once every couple months I went there and I could print some things out. Was basically. it like Iquitos? Yeah, it's kind of like Iquitos. <laughs> you know, bigger, bigger than Iquitos yeah. and a little bit even crazier. But, um, yeah, so I just, yeah, I had to make some shit up, but I was, I had a co like a, another Peace Corps volunteer was posted in the same village. He also taught there and it was this, uh, this, this guy named Stan and Stan was an 80, at the time he was like 80 years old, 81. And he was in the Peace Corps. He was in the Peace Corps. Whoa. He was, uh, he he had served in World War II. Wow. Was it World War II? Yeah. Yeah, he served in World War II. And then he, on the GI Bill, he like spent time in Paris as a writer. He's like this old New York Jewish guy. Wow. Um, who, who was a jazz drummer. He, he was in a jazz band with Woody Allen. Like he had all these stories and here he was Whoa. in the Peace Corps. So we got to like co-teach sometimes, which was fun. Like Stan was kind of the life of the party. So, um, at least people were excited when he was 81 there. year old, was 81 the life year of the party. old. Yeah, man, he was, yeah, he was something else. But, uh, yeah. So I just made up lesson plans. I, I taught, um, one day I taught, uh, a Tupac song <laughs> to the class to learn English. So that was kind of funny, like the white what's guy the, teaching song, a rap. Remember? Uh, yeah, Dear Mama. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, it was just one of the only Tupac songs with relatively wholesome lyrics. Yeah. And uh, it was Mother's Day, so I wanted to, you know, it was on the theme of Mother's Day. So but it was fun. I found myself explaining like American, like African-American street lingo to black people in Africa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. 23-year-old white guy from California yeah. explaining yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. So did you like? Did you enjoy that role though? Did you um, like the teaching role? Um, no, not really. No. I remember. I remember feel I was like a theme throughout my adult life is depression, and it really mm. hit me hard a lot when I was in Africa. I felt pretty isolated. When did the depression start? Probably yeah. when I was in college, or yeah, I think it was like late teens, early twenties. So when it really started to hit, is that, did you notice it then? Like yeah. Did you know, like, identify it as, like, oh, this is depression? or You know, the first time I identified it was, like, through a commercial for Paxil. It's like an antidepressant. Oh, right. I remember. And, yeah. But they were prescribing it for people with social anxiety. And I was in college at the time, and, you know, I'd go to parties, and I was really shy. And, you know, I had a hard time, like, approaching girls. And then I saw this commercial about Paxil, and it showed this, like, 
this guy who was like really confident talking to people having a good time so i was like ah, i want that <laughs> yeah with that like happy music and yeah 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 do you suffer from depression do you want to look like that guy yeah do you want yeah. to be like this guy yeah happy totally side effects may include suicidal thoughts <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> So, so did you, you got Paxil? Yeah, I got Paxil. That was the okay. first thing. At the time, I don't think I identified it with depression. I just thought that in some ways I thought I was actually um, like playing the system. And I went to the doctor almost feeling like I was faking what I was sharing because I just wanted the effect of the Paxil almost like a drug. But I didn't really necessarily, at the time, I don't know, I would have said I had depression. I just felt kind of socially awkward compared to what I perceived other people as. I felt shy. and um, So at that stage, I guess it wasn't until really I went to Africa, like getting into my mid to late 20s, that the deeper, like strong depression would, that would last for days, if not weeks. Um, and yeah, just moments of feeling completely like disassociated from from the people around me. So one day I'm like, really connected and talking and having a good time and people are like wow you're the life of the party and the next day I can you know barely get out a word that I without feeling really uncomfortable and judging myself um, I, yeah and in some ways I felt like two different people and I mm -hmm. had no idea why or how this would show up um, and what was going on it was um, I was also self-diagnosed with ADD mm -hmm. And so I got uh, Ritalin, so I was taking that in the Peace Corps, and that was actually contributing to depression. Mm -hmm. It just made me really down. Yeah, I got like, prescribed that when I was like 14. Oh, uh, yeah. Adderall. Adderall, yeah, I took yeah. Adderall too. Yeah, I took them all, really. Right. So, so were you taking Paxil when you were? Um, no, I stopped that, I think, before Peace Corps. Okay, um, you, that was just in college? Yeah, I was just in college, and actually, yeah, I don't know why I stopped, but I remember there were... I didn't stop with the guidance of a doctor. I just stopped. And there were some weird side effects from stopping, like um, times where I would just feel like my head was just like releasing some kind of chemical into my spine and I would like seize up. It was crazy, Whoa. crazy withdrawal, yeah. But I didn't really know. I, yeah. I in, in a way, I was like blissfully ignorant of what I was doing, right. which, which maybe eliminated some potential like fears that would have come up from that experience. But, But I stopped. I don't know why. Um, but Lynn later in life after Peace Corps, I got back on antidepressants for a little while and yeah, it was just always, I was just Is that when you went to New York? Um, that was, um, uh, after Peace Corps, I went back to the States and yeah, at some point within a couple of years of getting back to the States, so before I went to New York, maybe like a year before right. I got back on something. Um, I was just always really uncomfortable in my skin and, um, I was surrounded by a lot of like really great friends who who were really, at least on the surface, seemed really successful in life. And it was easy for them to connect with people and they were like consistent in their moods and behaviors. And I just wanted to be like them. And yeah. I, I felt, yeah, I felt really lost and without direction. And, and I thought it's just, you know, it's a brain chemistry thing and it just needs to be fixed. And it wasn't until later, like in the past few years that I really got an understanding about what it is and why it happened and, like how it can be healed. So, and what what is that? Uh, for me, uh, depression, and it might have even been like a mild bipolar. Um, I, it has, from my experience with like plant medicines, you know, I've realized that it, a lot of it has its roots in trauma for me. So, the most significant trauma in my life when I was uh, like when I was four years old, my mom died, mm -hmm. and um, I thought that. You know, by the time I was like 20, I thought, yeah, I'm over it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'm over it. And I've grown up. It's been a long time, whatever. I didn't realize that that actually stayed with me. And it, it yeah, I mean, trauma, um, that event kind of, it left a, naturally a huge impact in my kind of subconscious mind, in my body even, and how I carried myself. And, um, it's it's basically looking back at my adult life my adult life when it started to manifest again it's just like the energy of that trauma of that shock to my existence kept like replaying itself um and that that's how i can account for the moments where i felt disso disassociated and withdrawn from the world because that's exactly um what i went through when when i found out my mom died like i it was just like you know, I relived that experience actually through mm -hmm. Iboga, mm -hmm. and I 
I like went back to it and Iboga is what really brought me a lot of clarity and understanding of like what trauma is, at least for me and like how it played out. And basically that event until it's fully resolved can, you know, continues or continued. I think now I've worked through it a lot, but continued to replay itself like cyclically in just my experience of life. Um, uh, so it, yeah, anytime I would get close to someone in a relationship or, you know, move to a city and start to make friends, I would connect with them. And then all of a sudden I'd withdraw, run away, uh, move to a new city, get out of the relationship. I never, it was never in a relationship that lasted more than a year. And I just kept repeating this cycle of like getting close. And then as soon as I'm getting a little too close, phew, withdrawal, but it almost felt out of my control. You know, I, I just, you know, at the time I just thought, oh, if I go somewhere new, if I go to a new city and start a new life, everything will be okay. It was right. always, and it was for a minute and then the shit would come back up again. I couldn't get away from it, you know? Yeah. But it took me a long time to realize where it came from. I just, I really just thought there was just something wrong with me as opposed to simply something that needed to be healed. That there's nothing like ultimately wrong with me. It's just that I hadn't like come face to face and healed from the trauma. Yeah. yeah. It's like this, this open wound mm -hmm. that just keeps bleeding. And yeah. when you're that young, when mm -hmm. you're four, mm -hmm. you don't have the, the mental faculties to comprehend the finality of the situation. No, no, you don't. It's just this sort of energetic yeah, it's... trauma that needs to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it manifested for you in this depression. Right? Yeah. It's a trauma that until it actually goes, until it's released, it stays inside. And, um, and as long as it's inside, like the way that I saw it through the experience of Iboga, as long as it, it wasn't processed, it was, it became part of my operating system of life and like how I projected onto the world and how I saw the world. It was through the lens of that trauma. Like, and I didn't realize it. I didn't know it until I actually started to release it and started to see things with more clarity. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. It could be, it could be really tough. I mean, I've, I've struggled with, the, with depression myself uh -huh. and yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a difficult thing too to explain to people mm -hmm. because on the surface I could be this very outgoing, gregarious, you know, person. And then, but then I'll just spend weeks or months at a time just like laying on the floor feeling nothing. Yeah. It's not even like, oh, are you feeling sad? It's like, no, I'm feeling nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling like just detached from the world, isolated, alone, mm -hmm. bitter, resentful maybe towards society or whatever. And yeah. And it's hard for people that know you to understand it because they know you as the happy, fun laughy Mike. Yeah. Like the funny guy. Yeah. Or whatever they perceive you as. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, Hey, just cheer up. You it's know? a lonely just, place. Yeah. It's a very lonely place. Yeah. yeah. So that this, um, so your, your, your journey of, of sort of going and discovering what you wanted to do and, and these sorts of things, what, where, when was the time that you thought maybe, maybe psychedelics or maybe plant medicines could mm -hmm. play a part in my life? Was there a time that do you remember that something like that came to your mind? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, the first time I had mushrooms was in college, but I never associated it with, like, healing. Right. Just thought it was <laughs> an unpredictable experience. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it was fun, sometimes it was not so fun. Yeah. But I kept and, doing it. And you probably did it, like, at, like, a party or something. Yeah, like a party, yeah. yeah. with friends. Like. The very first time I did it was, uh, I was, like, freshman in college in Boulder, and we did it. We ate them in the dorm, you know. We went out. It was snowing. And I took my portable CD player, because that's what you listened to in 1998. <laughs> and uh, the CD, I just, I think there was just already a CD in there. It was D'Angelo. Yeah. You know D'Angelo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I will forever associate uh, this one D'Angelo album. Uh, what's the <laughs> album? Anyway, it's the one before Voodoo. It came out in, like, 97. D'Angelo yeah, and it, Mushrooms. Yeah, so I'll forever associate it with that and it was one of it was beautiful like it was snowing and there the trees like without leaves with the limbs were just like moving and d'angelo's playing and so for me that became mushroom music <laughs> <laughs> it's funny but uh, i i suppose it wasn't until that i really saw it as a potential for healing it was probably just uh only like a, a couple of years before coming here 
to the Amazon, probably just listening to podcasts and, um, uh, you know, actually when I was living in New York city, uh, having some depression, I did go out and went camping with a couple of friends and we ate a strong dose of mushrooms. And I think that might've been the time then like where I realized the next day, like how much it actually helped me because mm. I went into it kind of in a down place and had a hard experience with the mushrooms. But then the next day I felt completely different. I felt kind of reborn and something shifted and I was like, wow, there's something, there is something really to that. Yeah. Um, but it was really through podcasts and, yeah, people talking about ayahuasca all the time. Right. Yeah, we were talking about this the other yeah. night. This is what I found so interesting because here it is, and I'm doing this thing here. I have this podcast, and oftentimes I wonder, what the hell is this? You know, like, yeah. I, I don't know. You know, like, and then all you blue, you know, beautiful listeners out there will send me messages, and it keeps me going. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. okay, cool. I'm, I'm I'm hitting on something. I'm so it's it was really interesting for me to hear that from you too, as like. This, this this interesting sort of new but like throwbacky sort of medium of mm-hmm. like just hearing a conversation, hearing people talk about mm-hmm. things that you normally wouldn't hear people talk about. Yeah. And so that like that impacted you. Like totally. Throwing on the earbuds and just ju- jumping into a conversation yeah. of, on Joe Rogan or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talked about yeah, Joe Rogan or um, Aubrey Marcus, like those people. And I think the because it's only through a long form conversation where people actually start talking like in a natural way rather than like the pressure of a two minute TV conversation. But yeah. once people really settle into it, you start to hear like who they are. And I think through those listening to podcasts, like it's the first time I realized like, Oh, I'm not alone. Mm. Like I'm not alone in, in this like existential suffering that I'm going through. And, um, and, and it sounds like there's something that people can do about it. But just knowing I wasn't alone made like all the difference to me. And it, and people were verbalizing my experience in a way that I couldn't even verbalize to myself. And so just hearing people talk about it gave me a, um, like a perspective on my own experience of life and, and just started to give me tools. Like I would try what people were suggesting in terms of just like getting healthy, like going for a going running or yeah or you know taking action in my life like i realize okay well like i'm not eternally fucked up like like i can actually take responsibility i can i can do something about this yeah you have a choice i have a choice yeah yeah and so yeah it was yeah, it was podcast i think and yeah do you remember anyone in particular that really kind of like hit you as being like wow that's really eye-opening any like early podcast uh, conversations um, that you can recall yeah. Well, I think in like 2012 was the first time I heard Aubrey Marcus was on Joe Rogan. And I think it was the episode, it was an episode where he had just changed his name. His name was Chris before, I think. Mm-hmm. And he had just changed his name and he was just talking, he had just recently gotten back from Peru. And yeah, just the way he shared, man, and he opened up and I was like, wow, he's really opening up and he cried and, and, um, I think that really touched me in that interview. And, um, and then in New York city, like, uh, I think within a couple months of that, I think it was still 2012. There was this event called the ayahuasca monologues. Mm. It was like, uh, some theater in the East village and that was on. So I went to that and people were just getting up and talking about their experiences. And I realized, holy shit, there's like 500 people in this room. Like this is a thing. And, um, yeah, but just hearing people, talk about it sincerely and not not from a place of like this is a a trip and you know it's like really reasonable looking everyday people that i would never (laughs) guessed you know in my mind someone who goes drinks ayahuasca was just like you know like uh i had this idea of an image of what they would look like you know yes like like the hippie dreadlocks dreadlocks or just birkenstocks yeah yeah frisbees yeah and so i didn't associate with that image i'm like that's not me i'm and but then when i saw that uh, really well-spoken, reasonable, clear people have a lot of reverence for this. I was like, okay, well, there's, I'm willing to, uh, that, that kind of sparked it. But I didn't actually make the decision to come until I was living in L.A. I lived in L.A. for like six months right before coming here. Um, I had done some traveling, and I still didn't know what to do with my life. And so I moved to L.A. because I have friends there. And I got like really depressed in that time. I kind of hit the bottom. I was driving Uber for a living and um, 
surrounded by friends who are loving their life. They're all artists and musicians. And I just felt totally lost, man. Like, did you, did you feel like you had something inside of you mm. like that you wanted to bring out? Like you had something that you wanted to share. You just couldn't really pin, pin it down. Yeah. Did you some, have that kind of feeling e- being around those artists and yeah. people that are expressing their creativity. Yeah, I think so. And maybe just through the reflection of them, like these are my friends. My friends are, my friends in LA are people I consider really great people who are really creative and they're doing really beautiful things with their creativity and they're very successful in that. And the fact that they welcome me into their group of friends who are all just people like that. Well, if, if, if they're inviting me there and they, they like hanging out with me, even when I hate myself, like there must, I thought, well, there must be, there must be something there, but I couldn't really pinpoint what it was. That's, I was just lost, man. I don't mean to laugh at that, but I just think it's kind of funny that it's like, here you are and it's like in a way there's like two of you inside yeah. right and then everybody else is like yeah we want to hang out with alan like bring him around but then like the inner you is like no nah, we hate alan <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> it's like, he's wait, not you invited don't, you don't want to hang out with me <laughs> like i don't want to hang out with me what the fuck is up with that <laughs> totally man there it, and it, it's exactly like that it's like there's two people yeah and uh yeah my last couple months i was really really struggling I would have times I would go up to the top of my apartment building in LA and I would just like look over the edge and I would just, you know, just think about like, what if I just jump? Like, I, I don't think I was ever, in fact, I knew I was never going to do that. I don't have, but I was just thinking about, it. I was just mm-hmm. thinking about wanting to die. I just yeah. didn't, didn't want to be here. And, um, and so I, uh, this is August, 2014. I, I'm running out of money. The Uber is not really working out just because like I didn't have the motivation to like with Uber, you have to drive, you had to put in the hours. Yeah. And I was just like kind of slacking it and running out of money. And so I decided, I told myself, all right, I'm going to take my last, whatever, like $400 right now to take it out of the ATM. And I did that. And I was I decided I'm going to go to Las Vegas and I'm going to gamble. I'm either, I'm either going to win a shit ton of money or I'm going to die. Like that was, oh my that's God. It. That Leaving was my, Las Vegas. Yeah, that was, yeah, totally. A very dramatic choice. But that was my ultimatum with myself. And so I got in the car and I started driving. And I was driving through, it was like maybe halfway there in the middle of the desert in California. And uh, at some point I just, it's like midnight, it's middle of the night. And uh, I decided to pull off the road and I just got off the highway and I, went down some dirt road for like a mile away from the highway. I stopped the car and I got out and I'm like, I want to smoke some weed. So I like took some weed out. I think I had, yeah, I think I just pulled out some weed in a pipe and I climbed up to the roof of my car and I just smoked it and I laid back and looked at the stars. And then I just started like, for whatever reason in that moment, I started in that moment, I just started getting a lot of perspective on my life and what the hell am I doing? Like, really, you're going to go to Vegas or die? Like, um, just perspective, perspective, perspective. And then like a thought just came to me and I, to to this day, I don't know what it means, but, um, the thought was ayahuasca. It's just like, the thought was ayahuasca. I can help you. It was like uh, ayahuasca saying to me, it can help me. Mm. And, um, that way it was very like, unexpected i had known about ayahuasca from podcasts and things like that but in those past few months i hadn't really considered it at all um as an option just wasn't in my reality to i just moved to la i'm not gonna i don't have the money i'm not gonna just go to and drink ayahuasca whatever but it just came really strongly like that thought and um and so like in that moment on top of the car i just made a decision uh, to go back home, to call my sister the next day, ask for her help, and to make a plan to go to Peru and drink ayahuasca as soon as possible. And that's what I did. So this was like the beginning of August. By the end of September of that year, 2014, I first came here uh, for a retreat. And that's when, you know, that's when a lot of big changes started to happen. So, um, yeah, it's, you know, some people say, yeah, ayahuasca came to you in that moment. I don't know. I don't know what it means. Maybe it was just it, maybe it had, been in you know a, a decision I made subconsciously a long time ago, and it just came up in that moment and it needed to come up. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that's it led me to stop that pattern that I was in, and uh, which was very self destructive, and um, it gave me hope of like something I can do, as opposed to having this like like money or die mentality, which is kind of where I was at. So, yeah, just having that hope of like 
something I can do it would like give me a whole new like burst of energy and zest and 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 reason to to keep going and living and and actually for that last month in LA I was having a good time I was happy because I had something I had a I had a compass I had you know a direction to go and something to look forward to so yeah and um, and so you came down here uh, and you drank for the first time and drank ayahuasca for the first time how did that go what was that like um that was uh yeah it was the very first ayahuasca ceremony I had was to this day one of the one of the best because it was it was brand new and I was s- s- completely scared shitless going into it um I mean not like yeah just kind of nervous and scared I'd heard a lot of horror stories I heard that it can help but it can be really really hard you know I I think even hearing like people like Aubrey, Aubrey Marcus's stories like people have some pretty dramatic stories of getting dragged through thorns and yeah like just like dragons yeah dragons yeah all this yeah. stuff and I was like wow uh but uh it turned out that first ceremony was pure beauty love and bliss like I can't it's hard to explain, but it just, right. it just like for those four hours, I, my mind and consciousness completely left this state of, uh, depression and being a victim to life. And I just like what I saw, what felt like the true nature of existence. And it just felt like pure love. And I was just laughing and the facilitator in the ter- ceremony had to come to me cause I was laughing really loud and just kind of making a scene. And, um, and that's all I needed because, even though the cere- some of the ceremonies after that were hard, I had to face them, like, you know, face myself, look in the mirror, shadow stuff. That one ceremony, it's like it happened because I needed to have that hope and, like, kind of see, like, the end goal of almost, like, what this is all pointing towards. Yeah. So, yeah, the first one was great. And then, I, yeah, I went through ups and downs with it while it's a vomiting and it was very physical for me. Um, saw some really nasty things, had some other blissful moments, had a lot of times where I didn't feel like anything was happening, just, you know, a whole range of experiences. Um, but, uh, yeah. But do you, do you think that like, like, would you agree if I said that it was maybe like the, the hammer that cracked open the, or, you know, the ayahuasca was this thing that sort of was able to get through to you, was able to sort of reach you or, or clarify some things or, or provide you with this sort of experience that it provides one with when consuming this, mm-hmm. this, this brew, this like stuff. Yeah, sludge. Yeah. Um, did, did, you know, did you, I mean, obviously I think it's safe to say that it had that impact. On yeah. You, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I still like, I go back and forth in my own understanding of it as like, was it the ayahuasca that got through to me or did the ayahuasca, opened me, put me into a conscious space where I can get through to myself. Right. Kind of cleared things out of cleared the way. Cleared things out of the way and um, led me to look inwards. And um, But I think if anything, it just gave me a taste early on of like what it means to be like fully connected. Um, yeah. Um, so fully connected as a human being to to other human beings, to myself, to nature, to the stars, everything. Just like this, my heart was just ripped open and I'd never experienced that before. And um, even after those ceremonies, I would that, that feeling would kind of stay with me. I would just feel open and connected. And um, I realized like how closed I had really been for so long. And um, yeah, and that actually this feeling of open, like open hearted and connected to life was actually a natural state of being. Right. <laughs> it's a natural state of being, yeah. but... So many people mm. have been in your shoes, and I, being one of them, yeah. it's like, especially in in the United States, like, I think it's like one in five people are on antidepressants. Mm-hmm. There's like eighty eight thousand prescription pill overdoses per year, and all these things, heart disease, and you know, depression, anxiety. They, mm-hmm. so it, it seems like, I mean, to to sort of the average person it's like maybe well hey this is life i don't know Mm -hmm. but then you got a taste of like no no no, this is there's something this is this is what we're meant to do we're meant to feel this connection yeah 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 Yeah. and i don't even know if it's like we were like that's yeah that's i think the natural state of being but i also feel like well we're meant to go through all the suffering and pain because 
those are the doorways that lead one to realize that their natural state of being is connectedness. And like, if I hadn't suffered, if I hadn't had trauma, if I hadn't been depressed, if my life was kind of just handed to me on a platter, um, I wouldn't have seeked out, I wouldn't have gone down this road to get me to this point. Right. So I'm actually, I can truly say I'm grateful for all the, all the struggle along the way. And yeah, I do think that for the most part, uh, prescribing a pill and just treating depression as just a chemical imbalance in the brain is, is not, it's uh, not helpful. Right. I mean, it can be helpful temporarily. Like people are really suffering. Those pills do help, but, uh, it doesn't solve anything. Yeah. So then yeah. what happened after that? Like what happened after that, that first retreat? Uh, after that first retreat, I stayed here at this, uh, at this center and I, um, I did like a volunteer work exchange thing where I was helping out in the kitchen. And during that time, actually from pretty much early on in the very first retreat, I just felt like I wanted to stay here. And I was kind of in a position where I could do that. I'd left my life. I didn't have many commitments in the States. I had a car I needed to sell. I had some debt. That was the biggest thing. But I um, I just felt deeply I wanted to be here. And so, yeah, it kind of worked out that... Um, uh, after a few months, um, I expressed that I want to stay here. I would love to like be a facilitator. So someone who, um, helps like facilitate the retreats with people sitting in the ceremonies, assisting in the ceremonies, just felt really called to it. And everybody who worked here, I thought they were the coolest people in the world, you know? So, um, so it worked out. There was a need at the time and they saw that I could potentially be a fit. So then I spent several months just drinking, you know, 20 to 30, 20, to 25 times a month ayahuasca mm. just nonstop wow. drinking 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 just to get experience um, drinking ayahuasca yeah just going to every ceremony i possibly could and um yeah and then i started facilitating retreats and then i started getting into plant diets which is like like the, another yeah way of learning and connecting to plants it's kind of at the foundation of a lot of plant medicine indigenous traditions in terms of how they learn and how they, um, yeah, learn to work with plants in a healing way. So I started getting into diets and yeah. Yeah. And three years went by really quickly. Not, not like, not that like the Atkins diet or anything like no, that. I, like, yeah. <laughs> not, yeah, I guess it is. it's a, it's, it's like a, a period of you like consuming a particular, a particular plant, plant right? Yeah. Yeah. Where you're, the intention is to learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, yeah, it's a pretty interesting concept uh, because in the, cause it's a lot, a lot of times it's not a psychoactive plant. And so the way it works is, I mean, there's many different traditions that do plant diets and there's different ways of doing it. But essentially, generally, you, you spend you know anywhere from a week to a month to three months, sometimes a year, in relative isolation. And you, you eat a really limited diet of food, very bland food, generally just like a bit of fruit and some like, saltless flavorless like starch or fish or something and so the body starts to break down a bit and during that process you, you drink often you drink a, a tea or a brew of whatever plants you're working with and in the amazon there are certain plants that are considered master plants and by consuming that plants with that's served by a, a maestro a shaman you know your teacher um you you establish a connection with the spirit of that plant or the energy of that plant because your body becomes in a, into a, in a very open and receptive place due to the limited diet. And, uh, and then, yeah, the plant, I wouldn't even say from my experience, it didn't really teach me like a teacher would teach a student, like, all right, today we're going to learn about so-and-so and then like give you information. No, it's more like, yeah. today we're going to learn about soil. Yeah. <laughs> it's good for us. Yeah. <laughs> Light. Yeah. Um, no, it's more like, uh, it just led me through a process of transformation that sometimes I got insights through it, sometimes not, but all I really had to do was just kind of be present for it and open to it and sit through it. And sometimes it was really difficult, the diets, like just sitting in isolation all day with my mind. Yeah, what does hungry. that do? Like, what does that do to someone? Well, I learned a lot about my mind. I, I can only know what it did for me. I mean, yeah. I was a, it was a big process of just learning the nature of the mind because when you sit with yourself... Uh, for long periods of time with no interaction or anything and coupled with a minimal diet so you're hungry and uh, uh, and it's hot, it's the jungle and you're consuming a plant that even though like chemically it might not have psychoactive properties, it definitely does something. It does something 
to, in some cases, like just bringing up, um, like sometimes it would make my mind more active or bring clarity to the mental patterns that I have. Like it's still hard for me to even explain it, but for me, my diets were all about mostly about my mind. I think it, it, they also brought a lot of healing to my body and, um, uh, and like emotional releases. So in some diets I would get, ang- I just feel anger like for no reason mm. or, or, or sadness or sometimes they would bring up my depression really strongly and I'd have to sit through it and actually just gain a lot of awareness. So the diets are for me were just a time, a period to step away from everyday life and go into a really deep, uh, communion with myself and all my shit and, just sitting with myself sometimes it was excruciating you know yeah but but by doing it over and over and sitting through the my mind like sitting with my mind and just actually starting to listen to it like it 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 was very healing because i started to see the mind for what it is like it's not there's actually a voice in my head right it's the mind it's the ego it's the chatter that's judging everything and and uh but it can, I also realize that it like, it can change its opinion in a heartbeat. It's really inconsistent. <laughs> like one moment it loves this person the next I hate her. Like, uh, and so, yeah, I just, just started to really see it for what it is. And I think through that process of seeing it for what it is, it started to like quiet down or shift or something changed. I don't really. Yeah. 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 Is it, is it, you know, going through this process mm-hmm. of, drinking ayahuasca 25 times a month and then dieting plants going through the suffering going through the the pain and being in isolation being alone with the mind and it's mm-hmm. almost limitless power insanity to be complex and confusing <laughs> mm-hmm. that helps you with your work now and helping others who are going through what you went through the first time does it does that mean i mean is that sort of the point is to sort of that you've being a human being, I, I think that we're all we all have the capacity to, to have these similar type experiences of the mind. Mm-hmm. So, for you going through this, does that sort of give you the ability then to um, then deal with another person who might be who mm-hmm. might have been in your position, and now you sort of can see the pattern and see that the ha- is that is that accurate? Yeah, or? yeah, I would say it's that's pretty accurate. Um, yeah, I mean, like in my my work as a facilitator, I, I'd say my role isn't. For me, it's not that I'm not here to like heal anybody or do anything. I'm not here to teach anyone anything or tell anyone anything. I'm just here mainly to create a space so people can actually see it themselves and like go through this experience and start to look at themselves in the mirror. And so, um, you know, when I do sit and chat with people who are going through a process i think it's extremely useful that i've been down the road right and ultimately while everyone has a different story in life circumstance like this a lot of the suffering at at its foundation it's the same thing it's um, right and so i think the diets and all these experiences are what allow me to 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 hold space for people to go through their process and to not yeah to, to maybe see 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 clearly like what's going on like um yeah yeah it's it's hard to explain too but when i first started facilitating i thought my job is to like uh do something for people like uh, i'm gonna say the right thing and then they're gonna get it and then they're gonna like have this transformation you know and or they'll tell me about their ceremony and i will help them help them interpret it like and then they're gonna get it and they're gonna transform and heal but like over time I realized no, it has nothing to do with me and what I say and the more I facilitate, the less I say. And, um, it's really for me, all the healing that happens with these types of plants come through a person's own journey and like willingness to like, just look in the mirror. It's that simple. It's just to gain self-awareness mm. and no, no person outside of myself is going to give me self-awareness. I mean, they yeah. can, they can help like reflect it back to me, but no one can tell you those things. It's about experiences. Like psychedelics are all about experiential learning. Nice, ca- nice catch. There's a mosquito. Flying. <laughs> yeah, a couple of mosquitoes. <laughs> um, the point of the, the reason they're some they're such a great teacher is that it's experiential learning rather than 
reading a book and right. being told this is what enlightenment is or this is what trauma is. But you're going through it. You're living it. You're yeah. developing an emotional connection to that experience rather than just like an in- yeah. intellectual understanding of it. Yeah, it's experiential learning. Yeah. Yeah. And you're basically your own teacher. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's interesting because I think I think I might have thought the first time I came down was that, well, I'm going to do this ayahuasca thing and it's just going to fix me. Uh-huh. You know, I, I just had this interesting thought the other day. I don't know if this is necessarily connected, but it's just this kind of a side thought. Maybe mm-hmm. it's connected. But I was just like, well, ayahuasca is a plant. I, ayahuasca is actually two separate things mm-hmm. that are combined together. So that's mind blowing in the first part that in order to be activated, they need to be combined. Mm-hmm. Well, who combines them? We do. Right. Mm-hmm. So people have to be involved in combining these things together. And then for it to, to work, we drink it, we consume it. And it mm-hmm. becomes this sort of symbiotic relationship almost of, mm-hmm. of going through this experience because it's not like there's an ayahuasca plant creature walking around. He's going to come and do your taxes for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to, you, know, you have to, that would be great. Though. That would be amazing. I hope that that exists one day. <laughs> But uh, but what I'm saying is is basically like it's not it's not that anybody else is necessarily including ayahuasca is going to just c- completely change things for you, mm-hmm. right? It's a completely your choice. You yeah. have to be willing. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, people make it and then you choose to drink it, and it only works when it's when you consume it. When yeah. you consume it, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's the beauty of it. I think a lot. And I even in my suffering, uh, you know, for a long time, I just felt like a victim, a victim of my circumstance. I'm fucked up. I had a fucked up early childhood and my brain is messed up. I don't know why. Like, I'm screwed. I'm just like victim. And um, you can't be a victim with ayahuasca because you have to be proactive. You have to make a decision. You have to, you know, um, make a decision to, to take the, is it the blue pill or the red pill? Uh, the red pill. Yeah, that takes bravery. It takes like going into the unknown like that's an act of that's not a victim act that's an act of like uh, a willful act of courage right and um, that step alone like sometimes when i see people drink i think like like half of the healing that comes from this experience is just the sheer act of pouring that medicine down your throat yeah it's the sheer act of like willingness to go into fear and the unknown Mm. and then the experience that comes after obviously it can bring healing but just going through that like after a person does that it brings like a new like benchmark or standard in their experience of life it's like well i actually i went through that I, i went through that door i chose to drink that cup i managed to to do it and willingly do it and then like that kind of behavior if that's taken out into life I think leads also can lead to a a very fruitful and meaningful life because yeah it's yeah I'm learning that in my life like when I make choices to do things that are out of my comfort zone that are going into the unknown like that's where the meaning is it's so weird I mean it's it it makes I know that's the truth Mm -hmm. you know and I've learned that too but it's 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 almost like we need this like pressure or resistance or the challenge of venturing into the the realms of the unknown or the, you know, the danger areas, the places where we don't feel comfortable, Mm -hmm. but that's what leads to our transformations and our growth and can provide new opportunities. You would think that like, I don't know. I just find it, I find it interesting that a human being requires that almost in order to maybe, you know, in my opinion, live like a, full centered grounded yeah. whole complete loving life mm-hmm. yeah i think that uh why do you think that is yeah that's a good question because for a long time i thought the the goal of life is to just to be happy right yeah and just um, to be comfortable happy yeah. avoid problems and pain. yeah mm-hmm. yeah but then i see you know you, you see people that have it all all the money in the world all the women all the property all the cars everything um they have the money to have whatever they want whenever they want it like i think on the definition of life you're just supposed to be happy i think that should be able to provide it because you should be happy if you can get whatever you want whenever you want it but it doesn't seem to work oftentimes those people 
have major addictions and they they suffer i mean you just think of like i mean i just think of like famous people or yeah successful athletes who've done really well and then they just have really unhealthy patterns in life so yeah why is that i don't know uh but it seems now i've realized that life isn't for me uh, like my goal in life isn't to be happy it's to be to meet challenges and to like go into the unknown to expand my uh my limits and my barriers of what what i can do and to learn and grow and through that there's pain and suffering and i i think that's an inevitable inevitable part of life i thought if i drink enough ayahuasca like i'll get away from suffering and pain like i'll just be happy forever yeah just blissed out all blissed the time. out yeah but i'm more and more and i think it has to do with like things i'm reading and people that are influencing me now i'm who's I, influencing I, you now oh well we were talking about jordan peterson right earlier, yeah you know? and um yeah just hearing his talks and he's someone that that, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't have the words that he uses, but it, it really drilled in the message for me that life isn't just about just being happy. It's more about like being fulfilled and there's a difference. Right. And he also drilled in the message that like pain and difficulty happens in life. You're not going to get away from it. You're not going to, yeah. And so it's how it. you handle it rather than more than anything. And so, um, it, and and I think that's really in line with what I've learned through working with plants. It's like life still gets difficult. I still have difficult days. It's still hot in the jungle. There's still mosquitoes. I still meet people that like trigger things in me. Yeah. Like it, that hasn't changed. But my my willingness to accept it and to perceive that is that's actually quite normal has shifted also my um, my ability to like be with it and to be okay with it and you know, sometimes I'm not okay with it, but I'm, some part of me is okay with not being okay with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, oh, this is life. Life, there is suffering. And for a long time I was reading like uh stoic, stoic philosophy, you know, mm -hmm. I think, uh, yeah, this guy, Ryan Holiday. Yeah. 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 You know, Ego the, is the enemy. Yeah. And, uh, obstacle is the way. Yeah. Obstacle. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. He, oh, it's like reading his stuff got me into a bit of stoicism and I listened to like Marcus Aurelius and, mm -hmm. And meditation yeah and it's just like really down to earth straightforward stuff like life is hard <laughs> we must go through it and that's just how it is like yeah it's that's how it is and so now that i've kind of just moved past the illusion that i'm supposed to just be always happy and if not there's something wrong with me now that i've gone through that like i'm facing life with i just feel a little more realistic about it and and when it's hard, I don't get discouraged. I just view it as that's, it's an obstacle and it's an opportunity to learn. Mm, mm -hmm. And maybe, I think maybe a lot of this just comes with age. You yeah, know, it's older people. Yeah, experience, like with or without psychedelics, like you age. And if in the aging process, there's a willingness to learn just through life, then I think maybe this, you know, I always wonder like, what would I be like now? if I hadn't made the decision to come here, if I just kept living my life in the States. Like, if you just drove to Vegas. If I just drove to Vegas, maybe I'd be a billionaire. You know? <laughs> maybe I would really hit it big and I'd own a couple hotels. And You'd be on a yacht yeah, driving around with a couple of supermodels. That's it. But then there'd just be like a close-up of you and it's one tear One tear coming wall. down, yeah. A big <laughs> void in my heart. Some massive addiction. Yeah, who knows, man. But I, yeah, I do think that uh, life itself is, is like more and more I'm, yeah, I feel like life is the school. Like sometimes I just feel like it was something somehow intentionally made my life exactly this way. And everything has been an opportunity to learn and evolve everything that's happened. It's, it's, it's incredible. Like, but just having that, just making the choice to view life as school gives it all the meaning it gives. And it makes the suffering and difficulties. Okay. Like, school is hard sometimes yeah but you learn so yeah so yeah so do you, do you believe in sort of like um maybe like a, a destiny sort of thing or or maybe certain things happen for a reason some something like that uh, it seems like in the way that your life has has played out like do mm -hmm. you think there was some some meaning to that or do you th i mean I, think, I know that you you made meaning out of it yeah i think that's 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 what it is i think that at the foundation, we have a choice. We can make it mean whatever we want. I don't think, I mean, I don't experience life as having any meaning beyond what, what I choose to give it. Um, hmm. 
which uh, at first that was a really scary thought. Like, well, that means there's no meaning. <laughs> but um, I, I, I did a, a course. I did this like course. And one of the things they said is that life is meaningless. And it's meaningless that life is meaningless. Because a lot of people get stuck at life is meaningless. Oh, well, life is meaningless. So who cares what I do? I'll just go steal a car and like do a bunch of drugs. Like who cares? But if you go one step further, life is meaningless and it's meaningless that it's meaningless. That, that also, that can help dismiss like the existential crisis that arises from the realization that life is meaningless. Right. There's no meaning that it's meaningless. And then you create all the meaning. And then it's about making choices that give it meaning so that, uh, it's fulfilling and, you know, like, yeah, it's really, yeah. It's, it's, I think everybody knows that sense of being fulfilled or, or mm-hmm. having, maybe it comes in moments, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it comes in spurts. I, I think I used to live my life with this idea of like, well, as soon as I get to this point, then everything will be okay. Uh-huh. Like as soon as I get this, if I'm making like $80,000, then I'll be okay. Mm-hmm. If I have this job, then I'll be okay. If I have this apartment, then I'll be okay. But then I later learned that it's not necessarily for me, it's not about this attainment of these things or like climbing to this top of the mountain, planting my flag and taking a break. Mm, I'm done. I did it. I'm done. I did it. I could relax. Graduation's now cool now. Like yeah. I don't have to worry about anything. Doesn't stop. Yeah. And like, I think as I get older, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that the real joys in life come with these moments, mm-hmm. these little moments along the path of mm-hmm. whatever you're choosing to do, mm-hmm. you know, um, and there's the meaning. Like what, like what, what can you ex- describe a moment? Like well, the other night I was just, you know, laying in bed with my girlfriend and we mm-hmm. had some candles on and we were just kind of talking to each other and it was just a good moment. Yeah. Like it was just like, cool, we're not doing anything. Mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, I'm not Formula One racing and she's in the stands cheering me on or anything like mm-hmm. that. Or, I mean, that'd be a cool moment too, but yeah, just but sharing s- space with somebody. Something really simple. Yeah. yeah. Something simple. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I see that too. Um, yeah, more and more, I, I realized that it seems that it's like the nature of the mind to just want more. So no matter what is achieved, once that is achieved, the mind finds something else to need to achieve. Like that's its purpose. It, it, without that, it dies. Like the, mm. the the ego, the ego only exists because it 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 has a it has a re- it needs a reason a purpose something to attain and once that's attained well it has to create a new one yeah because if there was nothing then it would cease to exist and uh, yeah uh yeah i think it's also a process of getting older i realized you know, no matter what i achieve it doesn't there's just more yeah more to achieve and you're right it's those like moments those moments that are super simple that can provide just as much joy and fulfillment as winning the world cup as the star player like yeah yeah that guy's super blissed out i watched the world cup uh killian mbappe right he's just yeah. like super blissed out and cheering but and i i'm not i don't hang out with him but i imagine like you know a few days later he was at home and you know he probably like took a shit and he's like <laughs> it was you know, painful yeah or maybe he had a breakfast and his stomach was unsettled you know right. and like quickly there's the next thing to achieve like now now you got to win the next championship and like it doesn't stop. Just, That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I used to do stand up comedy, and when when yeah. I was doing that, I, I definitely felt these moments. Like, and I remember sitting there. I said this in the podcast a couple times, but I was sitting there with this comedian, and he was. I was just like, yeah, I don't know, man. I'm just not. I'm just feeling like depressed or whatever. And he's like, well, he's like, yeah, he's like, like every other comedian. Yeah, he's like, you're a comedian. <laughs> he's like, the only times we ever feel good is when we're on stage. That's why we do this. And I had this thought of like, holy shit, like. I'm on stage, I'm making a crowd laugh and then I walk off and then I'm just numb. And it's like that. And then it's cause I need the next thing. I need the next club, the next booking, the next amount of yeah. time. You got to get that Conan special. You got to get that comedy central special. Right. And it's just this, this thing. And although I think it's, it's good to have a balanced perspective of achievement. You know, I think mm-hmm. achieving things is, is good. But if you're kind of attaching to that, cause everything in my life was shit. You know, mm-hmm. so it was just, it was, this was the only thing. Mm-hmm. And that's, that was kind of unhealthy. It wasn't yeah. balanced. I want to talk more about that, like comedy, because that, that was, a, that was another, and first of all, I think like the depression is what makes a lot of comedians funny. Yeah. That's that outlook. 
but yeah, it's just one of those things like acting that I've always, that I still to this day, I want to like try, try yeah. it. Oh, you should. Yeah. Like one of the most exhilarating moments of my life where I entered like a flow state where time disappeared, all sense of myself disappeared is when I was the best man at a wedding and I was mm. giving the speech and it was a great speech. Like the crowd was laughing at everything and man, it was, it was the most incredible. It's exhilarating good feeling, feeling. Right? Yeah, man. Yeah. Just like the energy from the crowd just pulled and I lost who a sense of who I was. I was just flowing. I went off, off the speech. I went off, you know, script and I was just going and it was, so then I just had this idea like, well, if I crushed it at that, I should, I'll be, I'll be the best stand-up comedian ever. And maybe you will. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, like, uh, you, so what, le- what led you to like, stop doing that? It was, it was sort of that moment. Like uh-huh. I had, uh, I had yeah, been, unhealthy. I had been, um, I was walking dogs during the day to make money and then I was doing comedy at night and I just, I wasn't in a relationship and I was living very like degenerately, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, out all night till 4am drinking, eating chicken wings and like, you know, just doing drugs and, yeah. and, and it does become like everything is for the material now. Like everything yeah. is for the stage and make my life as comedic as possible. Yeah. I was always looking for jokes and everything and, and it just didn't feel, it just didn't feel like it was really serving me, you know, yeah, like it yeah. wasn't, and even though I was able to make people laugh and stuff, it was just like, I didn't feel totally whole and, and complete. And what was driving you to do it? Like what, what do you think was the, the a lot motivating of people, factor to, to do stand up? Yeah. A lot of people told me I was funny that I should do it. And I love stand up comedy. And so, yeah. yeah, I figured, yeah, maybe I could do this. And, you know, it turned out that I, that I could and, but it was it was weird because it was like sort of when I had attained this thing, like all of a sudden I was working the a couple comedy clubs and doing kind of like the entry level spot for like the new guys, you know, would come in do these things called check spots and mm-hmm. hanging out with other comedians and mm-hmm. you know like people like Ari Shafir would I'd be on a show with him or right. like you know other guys like that and it was like whoa cool these guys, but uh, but there was just something that wasn't really like totally clicking for me in terms of like. Be, this being like a fulfilling thing for my whole life. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I had all these other things and I was listening to podcasts too at the time. I was listening to this guy, Chris Ryan, who hosts a podcast, Tangentially Speaking. Mm-hmm, I'd yeah. love to get him on this show. Um, you hear that, Chris? Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he was talking about traveling and all this stuff and I was like, you know what? I never I never did this. Uh-huh. So I, I had money at the time um, and I just bought a one-way ticket to Bangkok and I had like an amazing experience uh-huh. traveling through Southeast Asia. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, do you think it's possible? Like, is it possible to be a comedian who has their shit together? Like, I think so. I think there's some, there's some of them out there. Joe Rogan, I guess. Joe Rogan does, you know, there's, there's other guys like that, but yeah, for me it was just, and then I remember Robin Williams died Yeah. and, and then I was looking at all the people that I was like, I loved in comedy, like Greg Giraldo, Patrice O'Neill, like all these people and they had all died too. And, and I was just like. I was like, yeah, I mean, if I, what's the goal here? Like mm-hmm. to be famous, to get rich, to be on television. And I, and it was right at the same time I had been discovering this sort of psychedelic world as being sort of a healing modality mm-hmm. just before I was just fucking around with it. So, mm-hmm. um, then I, yeah, I, I, I started this podcast. I came down here. Mm-hmm. Shit just changed. So, yeah, you know, um, life yeah. changed. Yeah. 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 Uh, but man, you, you did it though. You tried it. Like, yeah, I admire that. Oh, thanks. I, um, yeah, I mean, I, and that's just my story. Yeah. Like for me, like yeah. it's, I'm in no way saying that like stand up comedy is bad. Or it's unhealthy. Or, you know, and, yeah. It's, yeah. Like do it, like have fun, like what, whatever. But for me, like I reached this point where I was just like, huh, I've got everything that I wanted. Yeah. And it's like, but it's not good enough. Mm-hmm. You felt a deep call to. Yeah. And like, yeah. I, I remember being on the road and, and there was this well-known comedian and we were at this like, um, casino, it was like a Foxwoods or something. Mm. And we had just stayed in the Foxwood casino for three days, didn't go outside, Eesh. doing shows at night and, uh, and, and like doing cocaine in the room and trying to get like prostitute. I was yeah. just like, I was like, ah, yeah, so just, this is it. Like, this is the thing. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's how I felt. So, but yeah. I love what I'm doing now. And, uh, you yeah, know, I hear you, man. Yeah, I had well, I had about comedy. Like I had this ayahuasca ceremony that was about that. It was about it's partly about like 
the energetics of celebrity. And it was also about comedy. And like, I saw it in a very shamanic way. And that like a, a master comedian, because like the shamans here, you drink ayahuasca, right? And then nausea builds up and they're singing to it. And then the tension, the nausea builds up, they sing and then you purge. And like, a, I think a, a master comedian is very much like a shamanic act and that um, they, they have a, an ability to connect with the energy of the crowd through their words and their intention, raise the tension until it releases in the laughter, which is the purge. Mm -hmm. And then it purges and whew, the tension leaves yeah. the room. And then again, build it up, build it up, build it up. Bah, bah, tension. That's it's, great. It's it's pretty, yeah. That's spot on. Yeah. And and good comedy, really uh, good comedy, yeah. is when you can do that with truth. Yeah. You know, and then That's everybody goes, yes. Like we, we're laughing because we know it's true. Uh -huh. Maybe it's something that we're not supposed to say. Yeah. You it's, know? Yeah, it can be quite a revealing, healing for people. Healing, definitely. Yeah, I've listened to comedy that like I felt better afterwards. Oh, for know? sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, what's better than just laughing with a bunch of people? Yeah, laughing with a bunch of people about things that I've always wanted to say, but I couldn't or didn't know how, yeah. or things I realized that were bothering me that I couldn't express, and just like expressing and getting out, getting it out. Yeah, I think I have a lot of admiration and respect for people that do that, you know. And yeah, it's cool. And I know it's a sacrifice. Like you talked about the road, and that sounds like really hard, especially because a lot of comedians, that's their career is like kind of that. Right. They don't, most of them don't get super big with the Netflix special. There's a lot of guys just like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. on the road staying at shitty hotels and totally. Yeah. That's the life. And I know a ton of like hilarious comedians that probably no one knows. Mm -hmm. And they're just doing the circuits in, in New York or whatever and mm -hmm. on the road. But actually, I, I, I just rem remembered that, um, like Jordan Peterson actually talks about this thing where, where he talks about like, do the thing, because life is suffering. So do the thing in your life that, that is worth that the suffering uh -huh. that you can, that you can handle it. I, I didn't know it at the time, but that was like sort of my decision. It was like, well, if I'm going to inevitably experience su the suffering of life, yeah. do the thing that I love the most that justifies that suffering. Uh -huh, yeah. You know, and I, and I saw comedy as like, oh, it's not really doing it. And that yeah. kind of scared me because I thought that was it. You know, I quit right. my job and I was doing this. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, uh, that's a spot on, I think, description of that. And it's not about being happy. It's about being fulfilled. Yeah. So well, it's a, and giving like, value to the suffering. Right. Like what is worthy enough to you mm -hmm. to pursue, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I, looking back now after ayahuasca, I've had ceremonies that showed me this too. Like where did this desire to act come from? And it, And while I do appreciate the art form of it, at the time it was really coming from a desire to like be seen mm. to like uh yeah to to be seen and heard and and loved really like and uh because that part of me wasn't fulfilled at all you know i felt super lonely and i know a lot of actors that that's really what it is it's just like a an unmet need that is trying to be expressed in the form of a vocation right. the form of getting famous and all this stuff but deep down there's just like this void you know yeah and uh i, I you know i think a lot of people or that's whatever work they're doing they're doing it to fill a void rather than something that's deeply inspiring them from their from the depths of their soul you know mm -hmm. and, and that's what it yeah that's what i hope for myself and everyone else to find that are are you doing that now um i think you probably are right to a point yeah although you know i still i still have days where i I feel like this whole pattern of like, I feel like I need to be doing something else. Like I want to, I want to express something. This is, you know, like I, well, I've toyed with having a podcast too. Like, like I want to create something more In my life. I, I feel overall really fulfilled it. And it, I'm coming to realize like fulfillment for me comes really simply. Yeah. I thought it was, I had to do a lot to feel fulfilled. But um, if I have a day where, you know, I do my work, most of my paid work is like uh, just online, like stuff through the computer. Do that for like, you know, four to six hours a day. Once that's complete, I cook lunch. If I go for a hike, I live in the mountains. So a good three hour hike. Nice. I get to the top of something like that achievement. Mm -hmm. Achievement checked, fulfilled. <laughs> I made it to the top of the mountain, come home, build a fire, sit with my wife, listen to music, cook dinner. At the end of that day, generally, I feel fulfilled. I feel that sounds like. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah, I didn't have to like accomplish something big 
I just like met some very primal needs in terms of like getting to the top of a mountain <laughs> and building a fire. And then the next, and I, I feel, I feel satisfied, you know, mostly, but I still do like, I, I, I think it's, it's good and it's healthy to want to, I don't know. I just want to contribute something. Uh, what do you think that is? Like you're, yeah. you're a smart guy. You're, you, you were mentioning these books you were reading before yeah. Dostoevsky and I see you have an odd Shante, but you know, you're, you're educating yourself, you're learning, you're pushing oh. yourself forward. What, what is it that you think that you, that you want to communicate or that you want to express? That's a really good question. That's what I'm kind of toying with. And yeah, it's good to actually be asked that. Um, I, cause I, I feel, and I yeah. don't mean to be presumptuous, yeah. but I, I think that, I think, you know, I, I think it's, it's there. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's right at the, the edge maybe. Yeah. Well, am I, am I, am I encroaching too much? No, no, not at all. I mean, maybe you see, sometimes it seems like we can see in others before the person can see it themselves. But, um, I don't know. I think that, I think that every human being has an innate like gift to share for the, for the healing of humankind, for the betterment of humankind. And healing doesn't necessarily have to mean, you know, healing physically or healing depression, but healing can just come through like laughter or, you know, learning something or like contributing, you know, and, um, that's the part of my life that I don't feel like I'm fully there yet, but I feel like these past few years I've been all this learning and healing I've done on myself is, is really wanting to be expressed outwards now. It's like this, it's kind of the archetypal archetypal path of first you're ignorant then you learn and then you share and you teach or you share. And I, I really want to share, um, and, uh, you know, I, sometimes I hold ceremonies with other plants and things, um, and that, that's part of it. That's actually very, very fulfilling to, um, what other, what other plants, uh, tobacco and, uh, San Pedro Huachuma. It's a cactus. And when I do that, uh, that's also kind of, those are moments, you know, when holding ceremony that I enter that kind of flow state where I mm, kind of usually tend to just lose track of time and um kind of any concept of self i just become a, just you know, like embodied of just like being of service so that other people to go through the process and it's deeply fulfilling you know it's like um so but like something like a podcast there's there's a there's a need or desire in me that wants to express in the form of words whether it's written or spoken but i but i haven't quite reach like what i want to say <laughs> okay yeah. yeah maybe well i could see maybe, maybe you need to have more experience do yeah. more you know you facilitate these ceremonies and with these plants and mm -hmm. i mean you live you live in the mountains I, I could see you just being like a old bearded wise <laughs> you know imparter of of truths in the mountains there mm -hmm. like a gandalf yeah. stroking your beard yeah, and smoking pipe. a pipe yeah yeah. Come the children and learn. Yeah. But you know, I never, it's, <laughs> uh, that's, it's funny. And I, but I don't, I don't want to be the Gandalf who like chose to be Gandalf, you know, like Gandalf is Gandalf because, but he is who he is. He's not trying to be right. anything else. And, yeah. um, yeah, but I, and like just sitting with you and doing this podcast, is also it's inspiring me you know because um you're someone who's done it you're doing it you're putting it out there and um i think the biggest obstacle for me to up to this point is just putting myself out there it's like the doubting mind comes in like well what do i have to say um that anybody would care about you know or it's just you know i'll write something and just be really critical of it like yeah and um so it's that and it's also just finding um yeah, like a little more refinement in, in terms of like what I what 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 I want to say. All know? right, well, I'm going to push you a little bit, right? Okay, now. okay. And I don't mean to, to but so but because I, I look at someone like you, you yeah. have more experience than me with in with plant medicines. You're a tobacco, right? Mm. You're you've you've had many ayahuasca ceremonies. You've mm. dieted plants. You're you've worked with wachuma. I've, mm. I've never worked with wachuma. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and you've been on this, this path, this, you know, what we've talked about all podcasts. So you have, I'm sure you have something to say, like, mm -hmm. what would you, 
what would you like people like listening to this to know about life, like your experience and, and what you've come to learn and what you've come to know? It could be something about the mind. It could be something about anything that, uh, you know, and, and I know this is like putting you yeah. on the spot to answer this <laughs> no. like, huge question, but it's, you know, we're getting towards the end and I yeah. think it might be a good time to sort of like leave with, uh, like, what do you want people to know? Um, I mean, uh, I guess what what's present right now is um, when I reflect back on my time here. So I've been working at this ayahuasca center on and off for four years, and I, you know, I look at I'm able to kind of have snapshots of how I felt four years ago here versus now, and it's all with the same background. So the the environment hasn't changed. So there's still the ceremony space of Maloka. There's still the same trees. They've grown a little bit. But ultimately, it's the same environment. So people are different. They come and go. But still, it's interactions with people. Some people trigger me. Some people I feel connected to. The, the heat is the same. Some days it's really hot and sticky and mosquitoes. Sometimes it's just muddy and wet. Like, none of that changes. And so, for me, like, healing and uh, healing and evolving in life isn't so much about the outside Circum the outside environment changing because it doesn't change. Yeah, I've traveled the world. I've moved from city to city, and it might look different, but the same shit comes up. And so for me, uh, my path in life is not about changing external things. It's about evolving in the way I relate to what happens to me. So it's it's an internal path. So um, so. Uh, I used to think that once I have it all figured out, my life, the external circumstances will be perfect. I'll have the perfect wife, the perfect house, the perfect job, the perfect set of friends, and nothing will get in my way or bother me. But that's not the case, and I don't think that ever will be for me. And instead, um, it's about learning to let go of my need to control because I don't have any control mm. over the circumstances around me. All I have a choice in it is in how I relate to them. So I guess that's what I would say right now is um, life is about choosing to to relate. It's about choosing to either open towards whatever's arising, discomfort, triggers, pain, open towards it, welcome it, or turn away and resist it, but um, it doesn't go away. If you resist it, yeah. it just gets on your back and you're just going to be pulling it around until you actually turn around and face it. And um, by facing it, it, it's shined in the light of your consciousness and that's what enables it to transform and you know, no longer be something that you hold on to. Yeah. Do you feel like your your life has been transformed since that first time you came down here? My relation to life has transformed. Yeah, yeah. your relationship. How I relate to life has transformed dramatically, yeah. Dramatically. S yeah, totally. Yeah. Still hard sometimes. Still have a hard time when I hang out with my family and all these things, but um, I relate to it in a very, very different way. I, I, I view myself as entirely responsible for how I choose to relate to life, and uh, I no longer, 99% of the time, don't feel like a victim uh, anymore. I feel fully embodied in my responsibility for how I perceive life and how I project life. Yeah. So. Cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I got that feeling, like, you know, as soon as I met you, I was, you just seem very like centered, grounded, you know, and, mm. um, I mean, I, I guess a lot of people that work uh, appearances here. Appearances <laughs> can be deceiving. Huh? <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I think that it's, it's oftentimes, a, and that was a great story that you shared in, in your, about your life and like how, Maybe maybe sometimes it takes getting to that point where it's uh -huh. like you can go down this road or you can go down that road, and it's like, well, maybe going and doing this thing, maybe doing something that's a little risky, maybe quitting that job that you're just not happy at, but uh -huh. you don't necessarily know what you're going to do next. Going into the unknown. Yeah. Going into the unknown. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what it's all about. Because the alternative is what? It's the same old shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great, man. Well, yeah, yeah it's this really is, good. This has been good. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, yeah, you mentioned, do you want to talk about anything that you're, that you're reading currently or podcasts that you're listening to that, that you, that you've been learning a lot from or um, actually forget the podcast. Cause this is the only one people should listen to. Yeah, this is the only no, one I'm just kidding. Yeah. And, but and mine that you're, that you're 
learning or, or doing right now that's interesting? Um, well, I, yeah, I was sharing earlier, I'm, I'm reading uh, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Yeah. And um, I started reading it really just because it sounds cool. Like whenever someone tells me they're reading like Russian literature, 19th <laughs> century, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, like those are people who are, I respect. <laughs> I yeah. think they're cool. Yeah. And it could be because I, I just had a friend who was kind of a intellectual type and he, he was re- really into that stuff and I thought he was really cool. So yeah, I read it. I started reading it just to say I'd done it. But um, as I'm reading it, I'm really appreciating it. And it's not as daunting or as difficult as I thought it would be. And it takes some getting used to like the Russian names. Like their names are, there's yeah. like five different forms of each name. So someone can be referred to in five different ways and you have to like get used oh, to wow. that. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's really, really, really good. So now I want to go down the rabbit hole of Russian literature. Cool. Yeah. All right. So that's where I'm at. Russian literature in the jungle. Yeah, that's it. I listen to classical music and read Russian literature. That's my... That's the phase right now. So nice, <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. This this has been fun. Thanks a lot for listening, folks. Alan, do you have any uh, anything that you want to like plug or anything like that? Or yeah, actually, well, I want to make a commitment because uh, I, I mentioned that I I I very recently started a podcast. I made one episode. I interviewed someone, um, but I that was like three weeks ago, a month ago, and I, I'm just going to keep the ball rolling. And my aim is that. By the time you release this, like how? Yeah, maybe a couple of weeks. Okay. By the time you release this, I will have a name for the podcast, and um, you'll be able to refer to it in your podcast notes. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, you if heard it here first, willing. folks. He's committed on air, and uh, yeah. go and check that out. Hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thank Alan, you so much. Yeah. For thanks, Mike. The time. Yeah, this was awesome. Awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed that podcast as much as I did. You know what to do if you love this show. Share it, like it, spread it with your friends. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell a neighbor, tell a coworker. And uh, if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank. You can donate as little as a dollar a month. Or you can go on iTunes and leave me a nice five-star rating and review. Whatever you do, thank you for listening. Much love to you all. Peace.